And so I want to make sure that everybody's got a pair of sunglasses, and if you just make sure you hold on to them, because I'm going to tell you when I want you to put them on. And everybody got a pair? Okay, thank you. And so this is both about my personal and professional journey and how all this connects for me in terms of the title of this, in terms of how suicide led the way to a focus on closing the racial wealth gap. And so I talk about, let's start at the beginning for this journey to share with you how this is really connected and connected to me in a very personal way. And that starting at the beginning, I was 22 years old, and despite a successful academic journey through a great, great undergraduate school <laughs> and a graduate school, be clear that I felt worthless. My sense of who I was and how I viewed myself had also been reinforced by my journey through the graduate school of social work. The underlying message through that journey, the underlying message that hit upon my sense of who I was, included a framework that was a part of the economy of that training in terms of that time and we transitioned from my era from Negro to black, in terms of viewing myself as also having been believed that there was something wrong with me. And so what did that mean in terms of that stigma, something was wrong with me, and added to that depression? In terms of you talk about the earlier readings in terms of around the Negro, around the black, around being broken, broken home, father emotionally abusive of mother, single parent. My constant thought throughout that period of time, probably very unknown to many people, was about killing myself, suicide was my option. All the messages that I came upon reinforced my worthlessness in terms of who I was despite what I had achieved. And so this journey in terms of going through the mental health treatment system, because I was clear, I went to school social work. That was an option. But I didn't know until I had completed a very successful two successful therapeutic relationships much later in terms of past that journey and with women of color. And I didn't know three things having gone through that journey until then. I learned that my depression was situational. I learned that my journey through the helping system, through the mental health system of helping me had in fact reinforced me as this black woman as negative and as broken. I learned a third thing in my second therapeutic relationship with a phenomenal woman, but also phenomenal in terms of as a spiritualist. I learned that I had a gift, and she helped me own that gift, and she helped me over the years use that gift. But having gone through that system, it really was a transition for me to understand that I was not broken and that I had, in fact, to be responsible for the message about myself. And so that's the point that making this transition to talk about systems and looking at the world through the lens of systems, what does that look like? Because then I really began to better understand and go deeper to talk about what are those messages that come through that children of color, people of color, run into every day as they interact with systems in our country in terms of moving them and oftentimes believing to be helping systems. So the question me that I began to explore in lots of research and lots of writing and lots of journey throughout my career was, did the system treat me differently because of my race? In an unconscious way, or even more, did it treat me differently because of my race and because of my gender? And so what were those elements of that mental health treatment system that I, in fact, had to engage upon that was a part of my training, that was a part of all the things I did in terms of the field play? What were all those elements of that system in terms of talking about, understanding it wasn't just the providers that I came in contact with, it was the government policies 
that directed how they interacted with me and everyone else. But that system also meant there was, in fact, the number, the health insurance, who gets it, who doesn't, how that's directed. That's a part of that system. But all those systems contained to, that system dictated how I viewed myself as well as how other people of color respond to that. And so it was important to be clear that what happens that we all know in this room about systems in terms of how they reinforce one another to, in this case, come up with a very negative sense of who you are. So the journey had me ask a new question. The journey had me ask, are systems a place to look for sustainable social change? Is this truth about black and brown people the truth? Or is it in fact a part of how systems want to portray? And so what you see there is a statement that's recently come from the ever-growing gap in prosperity now. If the average black family wealth continues to grow at the same pace it has over the past three decades, it will take black families 228 years to amass the same amount of wealth that white families have today. It will take Latino families 84 years. And so, again, I continue to ask lots of questions during this journey in terms of what did that mean about systems in America? What were the common thread that continued to perpetuate and challenges? And that seemed to be different than what I was also hearing about lots of the helping and how do you change this person? How do you change that person? How do you fix that brokenness that black people have? And that seemed to be kind of confusing to me because if black and brown people were broken and all the laws that we had to go through in this country and all this had changed, why in fact do we still have such great wealth, health, Disparities it wasn't making sense in terms of that. That meant that we were just absolutely broken? Or did it mean something else? In fact, that that's not where the brokenness lies. Now this is where I say to you that you really have to have, and I believe not just this city, this state, but I believe this country has to have a new set of lens. And I'm gonna ask you before I click to the next slide, to put on your glasses. Because what I'm about to share with you on that news, that slide, is go for some of you, it won't be new information. For many of you, it won't be new, but it'll be a little uncomfortable. For some, it'll be brand new. But I really ask you to have a new set of lens to look at the world. The common thread that's a part of systems, a common thread that said to me I was broken, the common thread that says to many African American, Latino families, individuals, children, that they are broken, there's a system thread. We sometimes get confused about this issue of racism in terms of how it's morphed and moved inside of systems in terms of institutional and structural racism. And that lies inside of systems. And so if you understand this in terms of institutional racism, it really is about the policies, the practices, the procedures. And it works better for white people than for people of color. Often unintentional. And it's no longer about somebody necessarily, that they does exist, but necessarily deciding I'm a racist. It really is about the policies, the practice that go inside of our systems and institutions even if, in fact, those institutional systems are led by people of color. Let us not get confused. Let us not get confused as we talk about institutional and structural racism. And so we ask people to have a different set of lens on the world. This common thread, understanding all the systems that come into play inside of people's lives, all of our lives, from the health systems that we deal with, the educational system, educational system. Understand that public policy drives much of this. And would it be surprised any of you in this room? I doubt it. 
that public policy in our country is driven by this sense of universalist, that we're going to develop policy with a universal lens, and it's going to work for everyone, and everyone's going to benefit. And over and over we discover that's not true. That, in fact, it has led with issues in terms of institutional and structural racism. And those policy and practices continue to morph and grow in terms of they become a part of obviously what works better for people who have privilege. In this case, in our country, privilege of color in terms of white privilege. And so there's a, that false assumption about public policy. It comes critical. And so, Closing the racial wealth gap means you've got to begin to look at the system. Black and brown people are not broken. We begin to look and identify what the issues are in that system that contribute to the outcome in terms of the wealth gap that we have. And our focus, our focus being the organization I represent, Associated Black Terry, we know that a job is not wealth as we focus on a system, and I'll share a few moments. But in fact, a job is about Upward mobility is a path to gain some resources. It's really about providing real access in terms of that. And that's critical if we're going to seek a change in that racial wealth gap. So the question is, can we change the narrative? If I give you the narrative in terms of what the numbers say from a recent study that we commissioned in terms of what does it say about black and brown people in terms of working, not the unemployment number black and brown people that are working. And I will tell you in terms of the 63% of African Americans in the city in private sector, 63% work in low wage jobs and four sectors with high wage jobs available. Black and brown people are not broken. Why does that exist? And that, if we take it outside the city, lots of folks say, well, the city is a city. But let's look at the metro area in terms of the same data. 58% of African Americans in the metro area are in low wage jobs in four sectors that have high wage growth. So do we assume that black and brown people are broken? Or do we assume we need to look at the system and begin to work on that versus on people? And so for us, it's beginning to look at another system, the workforce system, that workforce ecosystem. Part of that ecosystem in terms of includes back to public policy, in terms of what lays that out. But back to policy even from a standpoint of employers. Employers are a part of that ecosystem. It includes a worker themselves who in fact want, may not even recognize they have the opportunity and in fact those policies that in fact set them up not to be able to move in terms of changing that wealth outcome. It includes, in fact, our criminal justice system that also contributes in terms of that racial wealth gap. And so if we're going to make a difference, we really do then have to go inside of those systems to actually influence them, to change them, to begin to uncover what those racialized barriers are. And even the best, the best of the leadership, again, this is about institutional structure. It's not calling you a racist. And so the lens, the new lens, are to help you see, help you begin this journey to uncover those systems issues that keep black and brown people. So what happens if we address the systemic issues versus assuming that people are broken? If we, in fact, address the systemic issues, if in fact we begin to work with employers to have them understand how some of their policies contribute to that 63%. And I'm pleased to say there are employers who begin to recognize that, you know, in healthcare, it's not okay that most of our workers that are in the lowest bottom of the jobs are all people of color and that absolutely have nothing in my middle range. What are the policies that are leading us to that? And I will tell you that in healthcare, many of the hospital administrators and part of this is how to influence them. And for those that don't know, what I do is I do a lot of influencing. <laughs> and so part of that is being at their table, helping them put on a new pair of lens, helping them see 
employers begin to look at what does that look like in terms of their policy that says that if you want to move up and get training, you have to get your supervisor's approval. But in fact, if that approval means that I've got to have a replacement, and that becomes critical in POTS, the kitchen, I don't get a replacement, and you don't get to go to training. So putting on a new lens to help begin the changes and helping workers understand how they also, in terms of providing the tools to manage an environment. We talk about this as code switching. How to help people understand managing an environment from where they come from is different than managing an environment internally. And so you want to give people those tools. And so I ask as I end, in terms of this journey that I've been on, to be clear that how I move from thinking about wanting to take my life, because a system continued to reinforce to tell me I was worthless, despite all of my academic positive outcomes, I was clear the answer lies in the system. So I ask you, if your new lens that you have on, to take them with you and use them. Let's look at the world differently if we're going to close the racial wealth gap. Thank you.